A very good morning to everyone and thank you for tuning into Icon Best 2021 a virtual conference on built environment science and technology organized by School of Architecture and Interior Design SRM Institute of Science and Technology on behalf of the coordinating team I Shanti Priya session moderator and professor of architecture and interior design welcome all the eminent scholars keynote speakers delegates and participants from all over the world to the International Virtual Conference on Built Environment Science and Technology. I welcome on and on and I am very excited to be amongst all of you in this conference room 4 for day 1 for noon session. This conference room 4 has presentations of 16 eminent keynote speakers from across the globe of topics ranging from cities and built environment, facade optimization and technologies, net zero energy building, retrofitting existing buildings, urban heat island, health and well-being of occupants and sustainable smart cities. The conference creates a platform for establishing the collaboration between academics, professionals and industries aiming at sharing of knowledge, research skills and discussions on the current issues. We at SRMist believe in sharing the knowledge with the academic world and beyond. As a part of this mission, this international conference intends to create a conclave for researchers academicians, students and industry personnel to participate in the process of active debate, discussion and deliberations. The theme of the conference, Built Environment Science and Technology with its various sub-themes which are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary focusing on the myriad tracks like cities and neighborhood, building science and technology, building materials and technology are much relevant in today's context. Since architectural technology is gaining momentum and evolving at a rapid pace, the architecture and the design practice cannot be left behind with the age-old practices and limiting systems of thinking. This conference archives comprehensive cutting-edge research in the field of built environment, science and technology and elevates the plane of discussion and pushes the knowledge horizon to the new frontiers. This conference intends to actively engage in the issues concerning human well-being through the framework of sustainable science and technology intended to improve occupants' health, comfort and productivity within the perspective of the built environment. I am sure that this conference will certainly challenge the state of art in the field of science and technology in the built environment and infuse novel ideas among the participants to critically look at the cutting-edge research in the frontier areas of architecture and allied domains. Like everyone, I am eager to listen to all the scientific presentations lined up for the day. Once again, I welcome all the captivating speakers across the world with us to disseminate their research knowledge to the research community. A very good morning to everyone and thank you for tuning into Icon Best 2021, a virtual conference on built environment science and technology organized by School of Architecture and Interior Design, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. On behalf of the coordinating team, I, Shanti Priya, session moderator and professor of architecture and interior design, welcome all the eminent scholars, keynote speakers, delegates and participants from all over the world to the International Virtual Conference on Built Environment Science and Technology. I welcome on and on and I am very excited to be amongst all of you in this conference room 4 for day 1 for noon session. This conference room 4 has presentations of 16 eminent keynote speakers from across the globe of topics ranging from cities and built environment, facade optimization and technologies, net zero energy building, retrofitting existing buildings, urban heat island, health and well-being of occupants and sustainable smart cities. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk to us about rethinking building design in a post-COVID heating world. This is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because COVID-19 is a global pandemic where urban built environment is facing significant challenges and in this talk she outlines various strategies for designing thermally comfortable and pandemic proof buildings. Our speaker is an Emeritus Professor of Architectural Engineering at Heriot-Watt University, UK and is an award-winning architect. Best known for her pioneering work on domestic solar energy in the UK and her leadership in the international solar cities movement. Please join hands with me in welcoming Dr. Susan Roof.
morning from Oxford. My name is Susan Rofe. I'm Emeritus Professor of Architectural Engineering at Heriot Watt University. And I'm absolutely delighted to share my developing ideas about how we design buildings for a post-COVID world, in a world that's also heating. And I'm delighted to share it with you at Icon Best 2021 at this International Conference on Built Environment Science and Technology at the SRM Institute of Science and Technology in Chennai with the School of Architecture and Interior Design. Now I'll go through this um, fairly quickly because I want you to really get to the gist of what I'm trying to achieve here because the world faces an absolute crisis at the moment with many different factors changing the way we think about our relationship with buildings. Now, if you look back from the 20th century, from vernacular buildings at the beginning of the 20th century to the international style buildings in so many countries around the world, um, these new developments were born not only of an idea that energy in the future would be too cheap to meter, but it took us from with new materials um, liberated by new technologies that he could heat and cool buildings. So really, you saw across the 20th century, good climatic design go out of the window. Those vernacular buildings had developed sometimes over thousands of years to be appropriate for local climates, landscapes, cultures, and economies. And of course, they all used as very little um, energy at all, and certainly no imported fossil fuel energy, except perhaps coal or wood. What we saw there was in the 1950s, the first buildings, and in India, that would have been, perhaps the first buildings would have been banks or hotels, where they developed air conditioning. The move to a more mechanically uh, conditioned world uh, really started um, in America in the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s and began to trickle through to other continents around the world. But in the 1970s and 80s, we had this huge energy crisis, largely in 72 when the price of oil spiked from um, something like $25 a barrel to $52 a barrel and then to $125 a barrel in 1980. And people thought, goodness, maybe energy is going to be a problem in the longer term. Um, we got intemperate climates. We got the move to passively heated solar buildings. And in places like India, we had this wonderful flowering of great climatic designers. You can see here with a new Delhi Tara Group housing by Charles, Charles Correa. Now, by the 1990s, we had in 1992, the Rio energy crisis. And people started to wake up to the fact that all this energy we were using was actually driving climate change. So in the 1990s, we saw the first nod towards um, energy efficiency as being the way we were going to pick the low hanging fruits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. But energy efficiency was in the 1990s and I wrote books about it and so on, was fairly simple. I mean, more insulation, less drafts in, in Europe, for instance, um, air tightness and trying to get rid of cold bridging and the introduction, again, of more and more machines to do the work of ventilating and heating and cooling buildings. That was in Europe, for instance, exemplified by the passive house movement. But around the world, there was this drive, I mean, which again started in America, which was bigger, um, basically develop a profit driven, uh, more space on smaller sites, more glass and um, larger and, and larger um, climate footprints. And you can see here, may I point out that 
an ordinary, naturally ventilated traditional building um, will use a fraction of the energy of a large prestigious glass building um, office, for instance, here, which needs so much more electrical energy to run the heaters and coolers and, and systems. Um, so, but how they got around it in regulations was that they would have a different regulation system for different types of buildings. So you wouldn't apply the same air, um, energy efficiency requirements to a large building. You would describe it as being a third, a good practice building, a third better than your typical office building. But they actually meant typical office building of the last gla large glass type. They didn't mean um, they didn't compare it to ordinary um, higher mass with smaller windows and naturally ventilated buildings. Now, by the noughties or the 2000s, um, sustainability began to overtake as the, the fancy mantra that we were being sold. But all of us will know um, that sustainability too comes with so many different variables that it's very easy to turn it into a fudge factor. I mean, here's the apples and pears of trying to compare um, a, a home office space with an eco label for white goods or re reduced fabric loss parameter. And you can see here that, um, for instance, in this particular housing, uh, green housing rating system, you could have a reduced fabric loss parameter compared to energy efficient lighting or a cycle store. And for this section of those ones, you'd only need two out of three. So you didn't actually need a better building. You needed a simple external low energy light bulb outside and a, and a 50 pound cycle store and you tick the same boxes. So in a way, there's a lot of greenwashing going on in these types of rating rules. But climate change was really beginning to, to kick in strongly. Um, and from the 50s, honestly, from the 50s to say the year 2000, 2010, we went from small air conditioned buildings to the great centers that nowhere knows better than, than India or the Gulf, how rapidly these, these um, city centers can develop. Um, we really have to ask ourselves now, are these dead ends? Are these good investments? Uh, what's the future? Um, what really constitutes a sustainable or durable settle, settlement? And I mean, this is just one example. Look, this is a brand new city south of New Delhi, which, what, 15 years has taken to build these buildings. Are they good investments? Are they good for the planet? Are they good for the people who live and work in them? Because once we got to the 2010s, things started going wrong. Uh, there was an urgent need now for re-looking at design in terms of resilience. And as the really hot weathers began to kick in, we had to sort of start taking climate change seriously. Not, not least in cooler, more temperate Northern Europe. And here is um, a, a chart showing the super spike of the 2003 heat wave in which 72,000 people died across Europe in that one heat wave event. And by 2050, that's in 30 years time, it's predicted that that will be a cool summer. So really we have to rethink. And then of course we have the terrible images around the world of the impacts of rain flooding, sea level rising. And we, we've known this for 20, 20 years. It's 
you know, places like the South Sea Islands have begun to flood quite catastrophically. I mean, you know yourselves from Mumbai and many right. of those images of how chronic that could be. But we have another key problem too, is that when you have all of these big glass buildings using huge amounts of energy, you're getting peaky buildings and peaky cities. They have huge surges at peak times for air conditioning. And you, you, we have brittle energy systems. I mean, this is Fukushima, that's a particular example um, that um, took offline all the nuclear um, power generation for the whole of Japan when it occurred. But we also have, you know, um, in America, this is 2003, 50 million people without energy for two days. And all of those buildings um, with fixed windows um, soon overheated and had to be evacuated. I mean, you know too well in India, the impacts in July 2012 of, 12 of your outage, which affected 620 million people. And then we throw in on all of these other problems, the wild card of COVID. Now, you should know that COVID spreads largely as aerosols exhaled from people. Um, it was denied initially and, um, by the World Health Organization, but it's become very clear that um, it's actually on the breath we exhale, which can travel large distances. And we suddenly started seeing that air conditioning systems were actually sources of cross infection. So you have an air conditioning machine, and this is an example based on an example of in restaurants, and it blows air across the infected tables to the uninfected people, so infecting them. And there are ways around this. What you can do is um, design spaces and rooms so that moving air is exhausted. And there's been a huge move now back to the, the importance of opening windows simply for expelling the um, infection. So even if you do have infections in spaces, um, people can avoid them by... Um, making sure that the, the um, line of direction of the airflow is not threatening. Um, the big wake up call for this came in a Beijing uh, restaurant where you had in a room without any windows, you had, uh, sorry, you had um, an outlet pass for the air and you had various air conditioning units, but you had in patient, patient one, and that air moving through um, infected um, over half of the people in the immediate area. Now, this, this is type of study has been done. It has to be very rigorous to be thought to be acceptable. But this was backed up by another restaurant example where you have a room air conditioner in the ceiling. And as it hits the wall with the infected patients, it's then bounced back and that moving air pushes out across people in adjacent tables. So HVAC has, has now been shown to have fundamental problems in the fight against COVID. Major transmission occurs indoors via aerosols more than in touch or droplets. The virus can last from for at least um, three hours, and if expelled by sneezing or coughing, it can actually reach six to eight meters from an infected person. At first, engineers suggested that it could be protected against using filters or UV disinfection in ducts. But what's been shown is that it's not what happens in the ducts behind the room grills, it's what happens in the rooms, between people in rooms. Um, although some infections has, have been shown to, to move between rooms because a lot of air in air-conditioned buildings is a, up to 80% recycled. 
So if you mix air better indoors, as some people think a solution might be, you're actually making a sort of virus soup, again, infecting more people. This is such a, an urgent challenge that people like Bjorn Olesen in, in the Technical University of Denmark now promote, propose that we need a revolution in ventilation design, perhaps shifting the emphasis to occupant focus design um, and to controlling the source of infections. So trying to do that in buildings may mean not letting infected people into spaces, maybe temperature checks before you go in or, or COVID tests, quickly identifying infected people in spaces and removing and isolating them, exhausting the virus effectively either by opening windows or ex mechanical exhaust through the walls using microenvironmental technologies that deal with incoming and outgoing air at a personal level has also been suggested. Isolating clusters to avoid super spreading. And this is something that's very effectively practiced in Japan. And then of course, educating people that directionality of airflow is key, not the speed of the air to blow a virus in a direction that avoid uh, avoids others and exhausts it to the outside, preventing it spreading further through duct systems in buildings or ships. So making people understand that it's the direction of the airflow that's critical. And also maybe now using local radiant heat sources that can be disinfected by wiping down in winter, rather here, radiant heating or cooling perhaps, um, and uh, so you're not using blown air through ducts and fans that um, direct flows away from air infected people, avoiding others through roof level windows, high level um, outlets through the walls and so on. So we believe, many of us uh, researching scientists in the field, that the World Health Organization's three W's advice is not enough wash your hands, wear a mask and watch your distance, they need to add the fourth W, windows, open them. Now, COVID-proof buildings and their occupants. How many hospital wards around the world look like this now? They're actually designed to spread the virus against such criteria. I mean, the COVID soup is in this room now. Um, and, and it's a pretty chilling idea. The super spreading events are, are incredibly important too. So you get, uh, we had this with a, a, in Boston, we had the Biogen um, annual conference where one person went in meeting a few other people who went on to infect thousands of other people. So the importance of getting this right in buildings is absolutely phenomenal. And set against that backdrop, um, we even have buildings, and this is a fairly greenfield site in Scotland, the Queen Elizabeth II Hospital opened in 2015, designed with no opening windows and having serious ongoing nosocomial or hospital acquired infection problems. Um, we really do have to rethink the way we design buildings. All buildings should have natural ventilation options now, not least for when the grid goes down and not least to be opened. And you can say, oh, it's too hot at certain times of year and so on. But that's where you use sensible opening strategies. So at nighttime, when it's cooler outside, you can open the windows to flush out the pathogens. Um, and what in Europe, particularly, this is led by Germany, in schools and hospitals and homes, they say regularly just open the windows to purge the air indoors from the pathogens. Now, why have we come to this? Why would we think it's sensible 
to design hospitals with no opening windows. And we've known that other pathogens like TB are ra rapidly can spread through air conditioning systems between wards and so on. Well, there's a number of profound flaws in the apparently robust indoor air quality science, which are used um, to inform building regulations that have been forcing increasingly people to keep windows closed. Now, mostly building regulations, as in America, um, are written by the HEVAC industry, who are paid according to how much equipment is put into buildings. Um, this is a real problem. It, it was identified with the tobacco industry, where there is an affiliation bias in the regulation system. So uh, much of the scientific evidence um, produced um, to encourage people to smoke indoors um, and of the, the, the healthiness of passive smoking was produced on poor, the basis of poor science by people who were employed largely by the HEVAC industry. So we've got flaw, flawed methodologies used to minimize comfort zones to preclude natural ventilation. And um, to simply put this is that the air conditioning industry has persuaded the world that you can only be comfortable between say 20 and 24 degrees centigrade. And this, this results in people um, you, wasting um, huge amounts of energy to chill buildings down to being uncomfortably cold um, when in fact people in a hot climate may be perfectly happy in much higher temperatures like um, 26, 27, if they've got a good breeze going through the building, even up to, in many places that I've lived in the Middle East, up to 30 degrees with a good breeze. So the air conditioning or the engineering approach to comfort uh, limits people to fixed um, comfort zones but the adaptive indoor temperature model, which we've pioneered from basically largely from Britain, is um, as it showed, demonstrated scientifically robustly that you could occupy buildings with a much wider range of temperatures. So saving not only money, but enabling them to be naturally ventilated. Um, the building regulators, um, have building classification systems that promote air conditioning. Um, and they, they have persuaded people that a higher class of building um, is one with much more air conditioning that can control temperatures down to a very, very small level. And um, this, this um, theory has been promoted around the world, for instance, through the LEED rating system where the lead rating system was originally written, you couldn't get a platinum if you didn't have a large um, central air conditioning system. Um, it was largely funded by carrier air conditioning in the early years, um, um, which is some, um, it's obviously, um, it's almost, it's, it's rather immoral to even suggest that, whereas we all know that higher quality buildings can have a much wider range of comfort solutions integrated into them. Now, um, carbon dioxide has been shown um, as a, an important proxy measure for indoor air quality, and the HEVAC industry sells that as a pollutant. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, as it's prevented, presented by many professionals. It's simply a measure of how many people you've got in a room and how great the need is, we believe, to open windows to purge it of high CO2 levels. Low air speeds um, required under many regulations preclude natural ventilation. Again, they're, they're often been originally written in Europe or America where higher air speeds uh, equate to drafts, whereas we know that higher air speeds in warmer climates are really uh, comfort producers. Uh, and then the last, uh, one of the last um, issues is productivity. There's very shaky evidence provided to show that um, in ACs, buildings with 
AC systems, you know, tightly controlled air conditioned systems, people are more productive. Whereas um, you have to look very carefully at these studies because in effect, the most productive people are the most comfortable. And that also involves um, feeling um, safe in the, the temperatures they're occupying. Sick building syndrome does not attract much industry funding nowadays because it's long been known that sick building system prevalence is significantly, significantly higher in air conditioned buildings than in buildings with simple mechanical ventilation and no humidification. So there's lots of biases written into the way we design buildings today. Now, alarm bells are ringing. All of those predictions, as I showed you from the 2003 European heat wave, are coming true. Um, India, you know better than most countries how catastrophic this um, issue is. And in 2020, you had really, um, every year seems to be um, record breaking heat waves in India. And in in 2020, Indians go to social media to vent their frustration at the ongoing heat wave with mercury soaring on Thursday, on Thursday to record breaking 51 degrees Celsius. I should point out that temperature is a political instability issue. The hotter it gets, people without the relief of being able to keep themselves cool get very angry. And where better can we see the damage done by unhappy um, citizens than in, in uh, America with the riots ensued? Because you can't have solutions that uh, apply only to the, the 5%, the 1% rich. You have to have solutions for the man on the street, the ordinary citizen, and this is an issue of equality, climate equality too. Um, now what happens or what happened in um, a, a older or traditional buildings was that you can see there's people around the world. This is data we took from Pakistan, but it's the same almost anywhere. As temperatures get to around about um, 25, 26, 27, 28, you begin to sweat more, more skin moisture, and um, then you desire more air velocity, you take off more clothes, you people adapt to those conditions, usually till around about in 35 degrees is the upper indoor um, comfort or acceptable temperature limit that we found studying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of data sets from around the world. It, typically, people can make themselves comfortable in buildings from 10 degrees centigrade to about around about 35 degrees centigrade. And what do they do when they get hot? They open the windows, 25 onwards and even, even earlier, and then they start to use the fans as they sweat more too, because of course, um, Increasing the air speeds takes that uh, moisture off the surface and automatically cools people. So we're looking at windows and fans. Um, lighting levels normally don't um, count. And of course, um, anything above sort of about 20 degrees centigrade, people have turned off their um, heaters. Above all, moving air cools occupants. Um, so people are... This is the percentage of people with moderate or profuse um, skin moisture and um, without air movement. People um, use this um, um, sweating or skin moisture as a very potent way of keeping cooler. And above about 35, it's, it's becoming impossible. Now, we have... Two um, books already published, Adaptive Thermal Comfort at the Heart of COVID Solutions. And I'm just writing the third one of the series, which is on how to stay comfortable 
uh, how to design comfortable buildings. But the solutions are absolutely um, embedded in the whole way we des design cities and our society too. Nowhere more so you'll know than in Delhi or the great um, Mumbai or Kolkata, um, where air pollution is a real problem. Are we able to um, think big enough now to start laying down the foundations of truly sustainable, resilient, and future-proofed cities? Well, sensible cities like Berlin have ordinances. So all of the footprints of buildings in traditional and modern Berlin need to be of a certain narrow footplate to enable all the rooms in them to be um, naturally ventilated. Um, a simple ordinance introduced maybe 100 years ago, um, which has made the DNA of the city um, open to re reverting for as much of a day as, or year as possible back to being a, a naturally vented, ventilated city. Now, recommendations for preparing buildings for pandemics. Nationally, you have to establish a national multidisciplinary task force of independent experts who do not suffer from um, affiliation bias to review building regulations with a view to reframing them to enhance the resilience and preparedness of the built environment in the face of future pandemics and climate change. All members must transparently declare affiliation and conflicts and of interest. At an urban scale, reduce pollution in the city so people can safely open windows for ventilation, comfort cooling, and to purge pathogens. At an urban scale, amend planning laws to ensure that building footprints are narrow enough to enable habitable rooms to have opening windows and natural light, as was enshrined in Berlin regulations. The urban scale, undertake windscaping studies to prevent and remove buildings that block natural air, airways through the city that flush out heat and pathogens. And a lot of um, seaside cities, Mumbai and so on, would traditionally have been designed so that the air flows from the ocean in the afternoons would have flushed out the pollution from the city. So take that very seriously, the heat island effect. Urban scale, create climate refuges across the city where people can get indoor, get outdoors into thermally safe environments while socially distancing during extreme heat waves or pandemics. Um, and I know Ahmadabad and um, the institute there, Rajan, Professor Rajan Rawal, is part of their India-wide um, um, movement to make um, Indian streets safe during extreme heat waves. That's imp hugely important. Buildings, change the national and local building regulations and guidelines to ensure that at least 25% of all building windows are opening, openable, and all habitable rooms can be naturally ventilated. Now, this has been included in the Manhattan, the New York um, proposals for making the city resilient after Sandy, because what happened in Sandy was all the entrances got flooded to many high-rise buildings in Manhattan. And for buildings where you couldn't open a window, um, the internal climate became absolutely toxic. So 25% um, at least of all building windows were recommended to be openable. Buildings, legislate, legislate for the universal adoption of adaptive thermal comfort standards for buildings that are now allowed for natural ventilation in buildings. Buildings should instigate a classification system that promotes naturally ventilated and mixed mode buildings above fully air conditioned ones. 
And in buildings, um, instigate a modal shift in heating and cooling away from air-driven HVAC systems that promote, promote pathogen transmission between spaces and people towards radiant systems where pathogens can be re removed by wiping surfaces. Um, buildings increase floor to ceiling heights in hospitals and schools to effect, eff enable effective buoyancy dri driven displacement ventilation to ex exhaust lighter aerosols and pollution from high level windows and openings. All buildings should be sh have shadable windows, security to ensure that people feel safe enough to open the windows, insect screens and ease of occupant usability of windows. Buildings, healthcare systems and facilities should provide separate safe patient visitor meeting spaces out with naturally ventilated wards um, to develop systems where windows can be um, closed through encounters between different groups of people within the buildings. So you can have safe meetings of people in, to prevent cross infection from people coming in to those who are in there. And make natural ventilation training mandatory for all engineers and architects. Transport, install opening windows in all public transport systems included, including buses, trains, trams, for use to either reduce pathogen loads in the vehicles and also to enhance natural cooling there. A huge list of, of things we should be aiming to do. But you've seen the scale of the challenges and you've experienced the scale of these challenges. And whether you're an interior designer who has to rethink how bill windows are, op are openable, how they're attractive, how they're protected, how they're shaded, this can be part of the palette of good interior design, as well as the absolute essential means for architects of um, creating resilient buildings. So architects, planners, legislators, interior designers, the responsibility for creating a resilient future is up to all of you working together. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Susan Rowe, for your insightful presentation on designing healthier, comfortable and pandemic-proof buildings. I am certain that the audience have found it to be a very informative presentation. Ergonomic articulated keyboard station for long working hours. Work smart by EPCO, simplifying lives. Slide in, slide out, rotate or lock, easy access of CPU below the desk. Work smart by EPCO, simplifying lives. Third generation concealed drawer slides for your furniture. EPCO, simplifying lives. EPCO sleek telescopic drawer slides for quality furniture, much more than most. EPCO simplifying lives. EPCO new generation concealed hinge for quality furniture, much more than most. EPCO simplifying lives. Ergonomic doorknob lock for your bedroom and bathroom doors. EBCO simplifying lives. Add design aesthetics to your furniture with aluminium profiles and handles. Live smart by EBCO simplifying lives. 
space utilization at its best. Wall bed fitting for compact multifunctional rooms. Live smart by EBCO, simplifying lives. Now, easy access to your bed storage with ProLift electric bed fitting. Live smart by EBCO, simplifying lives. Floor to ceiling walk-in wardrobe sliding system. Design it with glass and wooden panels as per your choice. Live smart by EBCO, simplifying lives.